In today's lecture, I'd like to talk to you about the true definition of temperature. And before, we've only talked about sort of a hand-waving way of talking about temperature, saying that temperature is the thing that's the same when things come to thermal equilibrium, um, and giving some relationships for simple systems between the energy, internal energy, and the temperature, and talk, saying that temperature is something a thermometer measures. But we didn't really give a true mathematical definition of temperature, and that's the focus of today's lecture. So here it is. In thermodynamics, we define the temperature as the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the internal energy, holding N and V constant, gives you 1 over the temperature. All right? Now, the reason that I define it this way, partial S with respect to U, instead of partial U with respect to S, is because we've spent a lot of time in previous lectures developing expressions for the entropy. Okay? So we're going to use those expressions for the entropy. But you could, if you wanted, write it as partial U with respect to S, holding N and V constant, and that being the temperature. Okay? That would also be true. Now, if you look at this expression, uh, even the units make sense here, right? Remember that S is joules per Kelvin, and of course the internal energy U is in joules. And so if you take joules per Kelvin divided by joules, you get 1 over Kelvin, which is, of course, 1 over the temperature. So dimensionally, that's accurate. At least one thing checks out. Remember in physics, we always want to make sure our units work, and if they don't, our answer's wrong, right? Okay, another check on this is to look at the entropy expressions that we've already developed for some of the systems and make sure that this relationship holds. That's a nice sanity check too, right? So here I show you the Sackler tetrad equation, which is the entropy for a monatomic ideal gas, okay? So S is equal to NK times the natural log of V over N times 4 pi MU over 3 NH squared to the 3 halves power, and then plus 5 halves NK, right? So what I can do to make uh, my life a little easier when it comes time to take the partial derivative of this admittedly somewhat heinous expression, right, with respect to the internal energy, is I can break it out using my what I know about logarithms and try and isolate my uh, internal energy kind of by itself. So what I've done here is factor out from that natural log everything that's not internal energy, and I've rewritten my expression. So that will give me nk times the natural log of v over n times 4 pi m, m over 3 nh squared to the 3 halves, right? So that's one natural log. And then plus the natural log of u to the 3 halves plus 5 halves. Remember, all that stuff inside the square brackets multiplies nk, okay? All right. Now, if I take the partial derivative of that expression with respect to u, it's a little easier because everything that doesn't explicitly contain the internal energy u, remember that you, you call that a constant. And that's how partial derivatives work. So the nk times the natural log of v over n thing, that horrible thing, that goes away. Uh, the partial derivative of that with respect to u is zero. As is the 5 halves nk, there's no u explicitly in there, and so that goes away. And so now we're just taking the partial derivative of nk times the natural log of u to the 3 halves. So that's pretty straightforward. Remember that when you raise something in the argument of a natural log to a power, you can pull it out front of the natural log. And so partial s with respect to u then reduces to the partial with respect to u of 3 halves nk times the natural log of u. And the derivative of something that's natural log of something, right? It's 1 over the thing. So this becomes 3 halves nk over u. That's my partial s with respect to u, assuming that n and v can be held constant. So 3 halves nk over u is then equal to 1 over t. So we're checking, remember, what we're doing here. We're checking to make sure this is true, okay? So u is 3 halves nkt, right? So if we rearrange this expression and solve for t, then we would have t is equal to u over 3 halves nk, which is u is 3 halves nkt over 3 halves nk, and everything cancels out, we end up with t. t equals t. So yeah. That checks out. All right, what does this all mean, though? Okay, let's, let's think more deeply about this and try to get into the meaning of this definition and what it can tell us. And so one thing that I like to do when I'm trying to really interpret something is to make some plots, right, um, of what these two variables are with respect to one another and think about what they look like and try and interpret them. So what I've done here 
is I've used maple. You can use whatever you want, but I had maple on my machine, so I used that one. I defined the expression for an ideal gas here. I expanded it all out and wrote it in, as you can see here. Um, and then I gave some values. Uh, which I thought were kind of every day for different things. So I looked at one mole of an ideal gas, which would mean big N is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, and then I plugged in for the constants that appear in the Sacker tetroid equation, like Planck's constant H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Um, Boltzmann's constant K is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. And then I chose to look at helium okay for my gas because why not it's a very common monatomic ideal gas right helium's mass is 7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms roughly okay so I plugged that in and then um, I chose one meter cube for a volume because everybody likes ones okay so plugging all those things in now I have an expression in maple that I can plot plotting s while varying u my internal energy so that's what I've done and I show that here on this graph, okay? So on the vertical axis is my entropy, and on the horizontal axis is my value of my internal energy U. And I just plot a little snapshot here of the graph. I don't go over a huge amount of range. I really wanted you to see the behavior at low U, um, which is why I chose this. Okay, so let's think about this um, deeply here. And let's think about it in terms of the slope, okay? Now, U is equal to 3 halves mkt. We know that. So at low values of the internal energy where U approaches zero, we have a slope that's almost straight vertical, okay? But remember that the slope of this curve, S uh, versus U, right? Partial S with respect to U is 1 over the temperature. So the slope corresponds to 1 over the temperature. So if the slope goes to infinity, basically, then that means that the temperature is approaching zero. And that makes sense because U is equal to 3 halves mkt. So as T approaches zero, U would approach zero, right? So that is the lower part of the graph. Now, notice that as our internal energy increases, the slope gets less and less steep on our um, S versus U curve, okay? Now, that makes sense if you think about it because... Um, here u is equal to 3 halves nkt, and as you go towards large u, which is large t, right, um, then you get a shallower and shallower slope, which means the slope is a smaller number, which is equal to 1 over the temperature. Now, if 1 over the temperature is a smaller number, that means the temperature is larger, and so that makes perfect sense looking at this graph, okay? All right, so another thing that we can think about when we look at this graph is that if you're at low internal energy and hence low temperature, a small gain in internal energy results in a large gain in the entropy, right? But as you increase your internal energy, your slope flattens out, which means that gains in entropy are smaller and smaller the higher your internal energy gets. Now, this is true for quote-unquote everyday or normal systems like gases, solids, liquids here on planet Earth, okay? Now, let's look at another system. Let's pick on another one that we've talked a lot about. This one is the Einstein solid, okay? So, here I have the formula for the Einstein solid when it's hot, okay? I pick on this one a lot. And remember that the formula for an Einstein solid for the hot case for the entropy would be, and this was covered in a previous lecture, okay, so go back to that one if you don't recognize this, but S is equal to NK times the natural log of Q over N plus 1. Now here N is the number of oscillators or bonds in your Einstein solid. Q is the number of excited states that those oscillators might be in, which corresponds to how hot the Einstein solid is. Is, right? So if you have a lot of these oscillators in an excited state, then it's hot because they've given enough energy to jump up in those energy levels. Okay, so Q is excited states and N is um, oscillators and of course K is Boltzmann's constant. So that's what that all is. Now Q, the number of excited states, we could also think is the number of energy units. So now let's go back in our thought process and remember some of the modern physics that we know, right? If you have a quantum harmonic oscillator, remember that an Einstein solid 
is atoms, which are the balls, connected by springs. The springs simulate the bonds, and these bonds are modeled as a quantum harmonic oscillator. If you solve the Schrodinger equation for that potential quantum harmonic oscillator, you get energy levels as shown in this equation here. E sub n is equal to n plus 1 half times hf, right? Here, little n is the energy level. In the ground state, n is equal to 0, and it goes up in integer steps from there. n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. f is the frequency of oscillation of our oscillator, and h is Planck's constant, okay? So, if you look at this, the energy levels in a quantum harmonic oscillator are evenly spaced, and the separation between neighboring levels is hf, right? So it goes 1 half hf, 3 halves hf, 5 halves, and so on and so forth. Those are spaced by hf, okay? Let's call hf epsilon, because Schroeder does, okay? That's the reason. <laughs> so if there's q excited states, then what that means is that you have that number of jumps above your ground state, okay? So that's how many steps you are in hf above your ground state, which is hf over 2, all right? So that's the idea here. So our total internal energy of the system would then be above the ground state by an amount q times epsilon, which is q times hf, okay? Otherwise, it's referencing the zero point of the internal energy, which would be you know, q is equal to zero. I hope that's clear. But if it's not, pause it for a minute and make sure that you've internalized that idea. Okay, so u is equal to q times epsilon. So we can solve for q and plug it back into our expression for s here. And that way, instead of s in terms of q and n, we have s in terms of the internal energy u, which is what we need to take that partial s with respect to u. So q here is u over epsilon. So, that means that we can write s is equal to nk times the natural log of u over epsilon over n plus 1. Breaking that out so that we can more easily take that partial derivative, we have s is equal to nk times the natural log of u minus the natural log of epsilon n plus 1. Now, everything that's not u, remember when you take a partial derivative, goes bye-bye, okay? Because there's no explicit u dependence. So, that natural log of epsilon n and the 1, bye-bye, right? That means that we just have the partial s with respect to u of nk log u, which is nk over u, right? So that's here, right? So that's nk over u, which is the partial of that expression with respect to u. Now that's equal to 1 over the temperature. All right, so that means, solving for the temperature, that the temperature is u over nk, or if you want to write it this way, u is equal to nkt. Now remember that for equipartition of energy, which is a previous lecture that you should watch if you haven't already, u is equal to f over 2 nkt, where f is the number of degrees of freedom. Now this makes sense for a 1d oscillator, right? Because we get uh, 1 half kt of energy for each degree of freedom, and each oscillator gets 2 degrees of freedom that comes from the kinetic and the potential energy terms. Okay, so there you go. Phew! Ready? Let's look at a plot. So, I had the entropy for an Einstein solid plugged in here for a hot Einstein solid, and I chose some numbers that I thought were small but somewhat reasonable. So, for example, I chose 10 to the 20th oscillators, and then I allowed the potential energy to, uh, I'm sorry, the internal energy to vary as I plotted S and plotted it here in Maple. And this is the curve that I got. Now, notice it looks a heck of a lot like that other curve, which makes sense because it's an everyday normal material, but let's discuss the implications, okay? U is equal to nkt here, so yet again, um, as the temperature goes to zero, my slope on my s versus u curve is going to blow up and go to infinity, which is what happens at low values of u. As u increases, right, t gets larger, so my sh slope gets shallower, right, so that makes sense. Also, just like my ideal gas, at low values of the internal energy, small gains in the internal energy mean large gains in the entropy. But as time goes on, right, and the thing heats up more and more and gains more internal energy, I get a smaller and smaller return on that in my entropy expression. Okay? Hope that makes sense. All right.
let's think about these kind of everyday solids and gases and what goes on um, if you let two systems interact. Okay, so this is figure 3.1 from Schroeder's textbook. What's going on in this figure is that we have two systems, A and B, which we have placed in contact and allowed to exchange energy, okay? Now, remember, in a previous lecture, we explored what the multiplicity looked like under these circumstances, okay? So, what we did was we had the uh, multiplicity for system A and the multiplicity for system B, right? And then we allowed system A and B to come into thermal contact and exchange energy. We plotted the multiplicity versus, right, the amount of energy that system A, for example, held. If system A held none of the energy and B held all of it, then that was a low multiplicity, right? Because that was only one way to do that. And then if system A held all the energy and B held none, there was only one way to do that. And then what happened was um, you would get a peak when the energy units were equally shared in between A and B. You get a peak in that multiplicity, all right? Now, the entropy plot would be exactly the same because you're just taking K times the natural log of the multiplicity. So, plotting the entropy expression, what you would see is a peak in the entropy expression for the total entropy of the system when A and B are equally sharing that energy. All right, so that's what's shown here. We've got a plot of entropy in units of K versus the energy QA that system A holds. So it plots here, here's the entropy of A, and you can see that the entropy of A goes up as A gets more and more energy. But as A gets more and more energy, B holds less, and so B comes to a maximum entropy when uh, it has all of it, and then it decays off to zero once it's not got any. So if you multiply these two things, to, or add these two things together, multiply the multiplicities means adding the entropies, remember that, then you find that your entropy expression comes to a peak when the energy is equally shared by weight between A and B. And that's what this plot shows, okay? Now, when the slope of this line, this total entropy line, is zero, that is when the system's are at equilibrium because the entropy is maximized at that point. And remember that when things are placed in thermal contact and move into thermal equilibrium, what will happen is they'll move until they reach that point where the entropy is maximized or the multiplicity is maximized. Okay? So that's here. Now, SA plus SB is equal to S total, right? Multiplying the multiplicities means adding the entropies. And so that's what we've got here. Now, if you do partial S with respect to U, then that is, okay, the partial of systems A with respect to UA plus the partial of SB with respect to UA. Because here, what we're allowing to vary is the number of energy units that A has, okay? That's what's plotted here on this graph. But since the number of energy units that A has varies inversely, right, or it varies negatively from the amount of energy that B has, right? In other words, energy is conserved. So if A gains energy, B loses it. Then I could write this as the derivative of SA with respect to UA minus the derivative of SB with respect to UB. Okay, so all I've done here is change the UA to the UB and stuck in a minus sign because as DUA goes up, DUB is going to go down that same amount. All right? Okay, so remember, it comes to equilibrium when the slope of the total entropy is zero. DS DU is equal to zero. That means that since DS DU is equal to DSA DUA minus DSB DUB, that DSA DUA equals DSB DUB when it's at equilibrium. Now, since Partial S with respect to U is 1 over temperature. That means that these things are going to equal the same temperature at equilibrium. Okay? Does that make sense? So, the temperature is the same between two systems at thermal equilibrium. 
All right. Whew. That all kind of makes sense once you have time to digest it. You want to see something that doesn't make sense? This is kind of fun. All right. For a black hole in a previous lecture, which you should watch if you haven't watched it, we developed um, and showed the following expression. 8 pi squared gm squared k over hc is equal to the entropy, okay? Actually, we did uh, an estimation of this expression, which was a little off, and then we talked about the true expression. But anyway, this is the true expression for the entropy of a black hole, okay? Now, remember that the assumption behind that um, experiment, or that thought experiment, was that the internal energy of a black hole was due to its rest mass, okay? And the rest mass of a black hole would be the mass of the black hole times the speed of light squared, mc squared, Einstein's favorite, famous expression. So if I use that expression, u is equal to mc squared, and then solve it and plug in for m squared, then I can get the entropy now as a function of the internal energy u instead of the mass. So that's what I've done here. Plugging in, m squared would be u squared over c to the fourth, okay? And so plugging in that for m squared, I get the entropy is equal to 8 pi squared g u squared k over h c to the fifth. Okay. Now, what we can do is we can take the partial of s with respect to u again and set that equal to 1 over the temperature. That's our true definition of temperature. Okay. This expression is pretty easy to take the partial derivative with respect to u. Uh, the partial derivative of u squared with respect to u is just 2u. So that means that 1 over t is 16 pi squared gku over hc to the fifth. Right? Rearranging. That means that u is equal to hc to the fifth over 16 pi squared gkt. Fine. Wait a second. For an ideal gas, u is equal to 3 halves nkt, right? So that means that as the internal energy increases, the temperature increases. But look here. Here we have internal energy increasing, temperature decreasing. That's different and weird. So what does that look like? Okay. It turns out that if you plot s with respect to u here, okay, and so basically I've got the entropy as the mass of the black hole increases, which means that the internal energy increases. This has a different curvature. This graph has a different curvature. Remember our other graph went like this. This graph is going like this, which means that at low internal energies, the slope is shallow and the slope gets steeper and steeper, right, as the internal energy increases. What all this means is that as a black hole gains energy, it gets colder, which is different from our normal systems of solids, liquids, and gases, where as the internal energy increases, the thing gets hotter. Different. Okay? So, this is problem 3.7 from Schroeder. Calculate the temperature of a black hole in terms of its mass n and evaluate the resulting expression for a one solar mass black hole. Sketch the entropy as a function of energy and discuss the implications. Okay, we already talked about that first part. We already did S versus U and discussed the implications. So now I'm going to just do the other part, okay? U here is mc squared, right, which is um, solving for our previous expression, hc to the fifth over 16 pi squared gkt. Now, for a one solar mass black hole, the sun's mass is 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. C is equal to the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. G is the gravitational constant, 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 in SI units. K is Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. Plugging all those things in to our expression, right? We get that the temperature is equal to 6 times 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin for a one solar mass black hole. In other words, that sucker is super cold. Really, really strange. And honestly, a one solar mass black hole isn't even really big for a black hole. The one's at the center of our, um, uh, um, not solar system, gosh. Anyway, the one's at the center of our galaxy. Thank you, that's the word are huge.
okay? So that would mean that the temperature would be even lower than that. It's crazy, all right? So these are some really weird systems, okay? All right, I think, um, let's see, no, I'll, I'll go for it. All right, here we go. Remember that we defined the heat capacity in this way, that the heat capacity at constant volume is the partial of the internal energy U with respect to the temperature holding volume and number of particles constant, okay? So for an Einstein solid, U was equal to NKT, which would mean that the heat capacity at constant volume was NK. It's a constant, in other words. Once you have a certain number of particles, that'll just give you a heat capacity that is some number. For a monatomic ideal gas, U is equal to 3 halves NKT. If you take the partial of that with respect to T, holding V and N constant, then you get CV is equal to 3 halves NK. So, you know, that's a constant once you fix the number of particles. Constant heat capacities, pretty standard, right? We're used to that sort of thing. It also means that, so for constant volume, remember, using the first law of thermodynamics, the change in the internal energy of the system is the heat plus the work right? Constant volume, work is zero because there's no change in volume, right? So that means that Q is equal to U, right? Which is equal to the heat capacity times the change in the temperature. So adding heat increases temperature. Standard. Black holes, right? U is HC to the fifth over 16 pi squared GKT. Take the derivative of that with respect to temperature, and you get minus hc to the fifth over 16 pi squared gkt squared. Negative hc to the fifth. So not only is this heat capacity not constant with temperature, like we have for solids and gases and things like that, right? But it's also negative. A negative heat capacity would mean that as you add energy, it gets colder which is what we already saw, right? We already interpreted that. So this is kind of fun. As black holes get more massive, more energetic, they get colder and colder, meaning they have a negative heat capacity. As they get colder and colder, their heat capacity grows and grows because T goes lower and lower, which causes that expression for CV to blow up, right? Okay. It's not a constant like ideal gases and Einstein solids. So that means that the more you give it, the more it takes, right? Schroeder calls this greedy in the book, right? They gobble stuff up. The more you give, the more they want, the more they take. As T goes to zero, they can take in an infinite amount of heat, right? And they get colder and colder and colder. Greedy, greedy things. Kind of fun. Okay, well, I'll stop there. I know that that's pretty mind-bending stuff if you really think about it hard and also slightly scary, so we'll stop there for the day. But as always, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.